Samuel judged Israel throughout his life. Every year, he would go on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mitzpah, and would judge Israel at all these locations. Then he would return to Ramah, because his home was there. He judged Israel there, and he built an altar to the Lord there. And chapter 8, when Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges over Israel. His firstborn son's name was Joel, and his second was Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. However, his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned toward dishonest prophet, took bribes, and perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and went to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Therefore, appoint a king to judge us, the same as all the other nations have. When they said, give us a king to judge us, Samuel considered their demand wrong, so he prayed to the Lord. But the Lord told him, listen to the people and everything they say to you. They have not rejected you, they have rejected me as their king. They are doing the same thing to you that they have done to me since the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day, abandoning me and worshipping other gods. Listen to them, but solemnly warn them and tell them about the customary rights of the king who will reign over them. Samuel told all the Lord's words to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, These are the rights of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and put them to his use in his chariots, on his horses, or running in front of his chariots. He can appoint them for his use as commanders of thousands or commanders of fifties, to plow his ground and reap his harvest, or to make his weapons of war and the equipment for his chariots. He can take your daughters to become perfumers, cooks, and bakers. He can take your best fields, vineyards, and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He can take a tenth of your grain and your vineyards and give them to his officials and servants. He can take your male servants, your female servants, your best cattle and your donkeys and use them for his work. He can take a tenth of your flocks and you yourselves can become his servants. When that day comes, you will cry out because of the king you've chosen for yourselves. But the Lord won't answer you on that day. The people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we must have a king over us. Then we'll be like all the other nations. Our king will judge us, go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel listened to all the people's words and then repeated them to the Lord. Listen to them, the Lord told Samuel, appoint a king for them. Then Samuel told the men of Israel, each of you go back to your city. And this is the word of the Lord and Roy is going to come now and preach on it. Um, just a, a precursor, um, um, Isaac just read, uh, you know, from uh, just chapter 8, really, and um, I'm, my task is to do five chapters, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. So if you've never sat through a two-hour sermon before, <laughs> you're not about to do so tonight, don't worry. I'll do my best to be brief, but we will just be briefly touching on some of these things. Uh, turn our attention to God's Word now. As you know, we've been making our way through 1 Samuel. Uh, it's no surprise to us. And throughout the book, there, there has been a repeated theme that has continued to come up. And we're going to see that come out in our scripture again tonight. And that, that's that Israel really struggled to find good leaders. Uh, time and time again, it seems that throughout Scripture, they had an abundance of failed leaders because it's almost as if God was trying to tell them something, tell us something with the leaders that we sometimes have, that, that at the end of the day, maybe that's because we need to be looking for a better leader, a perfect leader, a leader who will not fail us and who will never forsake us. And as we know as Christians, that is Christ, and that's where we're going to head tonight. But before we do, let's pray, and then let's open up. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, not only your blessings, but even your judgments. Uh, it, it's a strange thing to be able to say that we bless you for the judgments you bring upon your people, because it's by them that we are solemnly warned and reminded of our need for Christ. And so we ask, Lord, that as we come to this passage, that you would speak to us and you would help us to know our great King and God, 
Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, in recent weeks, the elders here at Grace have been looking into the concept of leadership, wisdom in leadership. What is it that makes a a good Christian leader in a local Christian church? And in particular, we've been going through a book by um, a guy named Craig Hamilton. He's a pastor here in Australia in central New South Wales on the coast of New South Wales. And for the most part, it's actually been a pretty good book. Uh, One of the things that's been really helpful for me in particular is as we're making our way through this book, um, we've sort of been on the right track, as it were, by this this book uh, when it comes to the right Christian leaders here at Grace that we've been looking to put uh, into leadership and to train up young leaders in the ministry. And uh, if you know anything about healthy churches and uh, really any kind of system that has teams, uh, you'll know that time and time again, it all begins with having the right leadership. In fact, Craig's been taking us through the book of 2 Corinthians in the mornings, and that's been a blessing to see uh, everything it takes to be a godly Christian leader or the, the things that we should be looking for in godly Christian leaders, things like integrity and character and suffering and calling and forgiveness. <clears throat> but most of us already have concepts, uh, uh, characteristics, things that we think of. When I, when I say to you, godly Christian leader, those three words, immediately some qualities will come to your mind naturally to your mind, because that's just the way that we're wired. And, and, and for most of us, we'd probably go, if we know our Bibles, to 1 Timothy chapter 3, Titus chapter 1, about the quali- qualifications for elders, and we'd certainly affirm those here at Grace. Uh, others of us might go to uh, some extra things that we like, some personal qualities, maybe able to teach means for us that unless they can preach like John Piper for 45 minutes, then they can't be a good Christian leader. And, and still others will be, you know, I want someone who's, who's personable, who's, who's good with people, maybe one who uh, is not so focused on people, but more focused on the Bible. We all have qualities and characteristics we look for. But of course, all of that begs the, the very obvious question is, what is it that God looks for in leaders who will lead his people well? And in a lot of ways, that's the exact question Israel should have been asking themselves here in 1 Samuel 8 as it came to the end of Samuel's reign as a judge. Now, for the last several weeks, we have been looking at uh, 1 Samuel Uh, chapters 1 to 7, and Andy's done a wonderful job in explaining to us the rise and fall of God's king and kingdom uh, in Israel. We've seen this is a book that is about how the, the sovereign God of this world, our great God and king, guides history to give us the king that we need. We've seen the Ark of the Covenant was returned to Israel just last week in chapter 7, and that's part of the reason why I got Isaac to read just a few verses back in chapter 7 to show us that uh, Samuel has been teaching for many years, come to chapter 8, he's been teaching for many years, he's leading the nation in this national repentance and confession of sin, there is peace in the land, there's prosperity in the leadership. And so as we begin to dive into this portion of God's Word, chapter 8 here tonight, we're about to see a monumental shift in the structure of Israel's leadership. Israel is going to go from having a theocratic, that is just a God-led, a theocratic democracy, to having a theocratic monarchy. That is, they're going to go from having judges in the land who rule over men to having one single man to rule over the land. And that really is a monumental moment that's going to alter the history of uh, the world in order to make way for the rise and fall of Israel's great, uh, great King David, who is a picture, he's a shadow of the ultimate king and redeemer, Jesus Christ. So this really is God guiding history to give us the king, the ultimate king Christ Jesus that we need. But let's focus on chapters 8 to 12 here tonight. And the main point that I want us to see as we come to our portion of Scripture is that if you abandon God as your ultimate king, God may just give you the leaders you deserve or the leaders you ask for. 
If you abandon God as your ultimate king and leader, God may just give you. Now, I say may because sometimes he, he doesn't give us the leaders we deserve. Sometimes he, he, he's gracious and gives us good leaders despite our wicked and sinful hearts. But often, God will give you the leaders you deserve and ask for when you abandon God as your king. We see that in three points. The king we rejected, king we asked for, the king we need. So let's read verse 1, chapter 8. Samuel writes this. When Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges over Israel. Now his firstborn son was Joel and his second was Abijar and they were judges in Beersheba. However, his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned toward dishonest prophet. They took bribes and they perverted justice. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and went to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, look, you're old. Your sons don't walk in your ways. Therefore, appoint a king to judge us the same as all the other nations have. And when they said, give us a king to judge us, Samuel considered their demand wrong. So he prayed to the Lord, but the Lord said to him, listen to the people and everything they say to you, for they've not rejected you, but they've rejected me as their king. And they're doing the same thing to you that they've done to me since the day I brought them out of Egypt until this day. This is nothing new for the people of God, says God. They've been doing the same thing time and time again, abandoning me and worshiping other gods. Listen to them, but solemnly warn them and tell them about the customary rights of the king who will reign over them. <clears throat> Decades have passed since the ending of 1 Samuel 7. There is a significant time lapse, as I said, we've uh, seen worship is being offered in these cities. Samuel's doing well as a judge. Uh, and at long, long, long last, the people of God are living in right relationship with him and in right relationship with one another. There is peace in the land. There's peace with their enemies at the moment. There is prosperity in the leadership. And yet, as is so often the case, we open up to 1 Samuel chapter 8, and we see that things in the nation are starting to rapidly decline and unravel. And perhaps surprisingly for us, this decline, this slow, steady drift into sin begins with the person and work of Samuel himself. Samuel's now at the end of his old age, and he makes this unprecedented move. Something that's never really been done in the history of Israel before, he appoints for himself leaders in Israel in this hereditary move of authority, sort of like a nepotistic kind of replacement of himself. He gets his sons to replace him. See, up until this point in the nation of Israel, uh, no one's really appointed a judge or a leader except for God himself. God has been the one to raise up the leaders because God is the ultimate king. He is the ultimate leader of the nation. And so here comes Sam Samuel, and he's seen what it's like to have these wicked and evil judges and rulers over his people. He doesn't want to make that same mistake, so he appoints his sons, and yet the irony is that the very ones, the very men that Samuel is wanting to avoid in leadership, Samuel appoints those guys. Samuel doesn't want to appoint corrupt and wicked leaders, yet Samuel appoints corrupt and wicked leaders. There's a tendency in parents to overlook a big multitude of their children's sins. Verse 3 tells us, His sons did not walk in his ways, but they turned toward dishonest prophet, took bribes, and perverted justice. It's almost as though Samuel is now hitting the repeat button on a situation we saw earlier in 1 Samuel 2 with Eli's sons, the priests Hophni and Phinehas a warning to us all of how we can drift away slowly from what God has done for us. And lest we think that Samuel, even a guy like Samuel, a prophet, a priest serving in the household of God, lest we think that he was immune to making poor and silly decisions, we need to remember the, the old saying that, that has it, at the best of times and in the best of places, the best of men are men at best. At the best of times, in the best of places, the best of men are men 
at best. When, when you try to take matters into your own fickle human hands, even as God's leaders, as a good and godly leader like Samuel was, without consulting the wisdom of the scriptures or even without consulting other people. This is part of the reason God puts us in community as Christians, as, as one another's in scripture are filled out. We need people to speak into our lives because we are not so objective as we like to believe that we are. And when we are not as objective, when we refuse to listen to the counsel of Scripture and the counsel of godly men and women that God has put around us, we will tend to make tenuous and poor decisions that are not based on the wisdom of the Lord. Now, the other thing I think is important to mention here is that time and time again, so many things come down to the family unit. Uh, This is a critical area of responsibility that God is deeply concerned with and fathers in particular have a unique role and responsibility as the leader of the home to do everything they can to ensure that their children are walking according to the wisdom and to the ways of Scripture and to connect God's law to the situation that God has placed them in. See, Samuel's sons had not connected the demands of God's law with their role as judges. And if they had, they'd ignored them. Now, to be fair, we don't know much about Samuel's parenting situation here. We we don't know what kind of a father he was. Perhaps he was a far better father than what we are actually led to believe. Many a preacher has shot Samuel down in sermons as a bad father or a bad leader. Perhaps he was was an okay father. He he seemed to be very busy, as we saw in in, in, uh, chapter 7, 15 and onwards. Perhaps he didn't spend enough time, but it was his job as the judge of Israel to make sure that there were the right kinds of judges to replace him. And and no doubt his sons, Joel and Abijah, had had showed these characteristics of perverting justice and and going after dishonest prophet. They they would have showed these characteristics before becoming judges. Maybe Samuel was becoming desperate. He's at the end of his old age and he went shopping on an empty stomach. You don't go to the shops on an empty stomach because you will buy junk food. When you become desperate and coming to the end of your time and you need to just quickly put someone in leadership, you will become desperate. That's how a lot of churches have the wrong kinds of leaders. Regardless of the situation here, the people of Israel recognize that they've been here before. And so they come to Samuel in verse 4 and they said to him, give us a king to judge us like all the other nations. They wanted this so that they may have someone to go out to fight before them in battle and to protect them physically from their enemies. That's verse 4, verse 19, and verse 20. Now, what's really interesting about this is that uh, God had never forbidden Israel to have a king to rule over them. I don't know if you guys knew that, but having a king was never off limits for the nation of Israel. In Deuteronomy 17, God says that Israel was in fact allowed to have a king. The only stipulations, he could not be a king that was a foreigner. Neither could he multiply for himself military, marriages, or money. Those were the three M's that were off limits for Israel's king. Other than that, they were free to have a monarch to rule over them. So the problem was not that they asked for a king. The problem was the kind of king they were after. They wanted a king, quote, like all the other nations. They wanted a political ruler, a political militant king, an earthly king with military power and force to destroy God's enemies. But God had called Israel as a kingdom of priests. He had called them to be holy, to be set apart, to be different from all the other nations. Israel wanted a king that was malleable, a king who was complicit, a king that they could speak into the ear of, a king who would act quickly and give them greater independence from the direct rule of the Lord. 
See, the problem is that if God's your king, who's, he's immaterial, he's, he's, he's everywhere, but he's also not a king that you can sort of see and, and touch and, and, and manipulate, they knew that if God was continuing to be their king, that would require a lot of prayer, a lot of patience, and a lot of courageous faith. Things in our lives that we struggle with because we find it difficult to trust in an immaterial God who often works on his own time and not ours. And so ultimately, I think that Israel's request for a king like the nations comes down to a lack of faith. They did not believe that God was sufficient to keep his word, to keep his promises, and to uphold his word as the leader and defender of the nation of Israel. Here's how the 19th century reform pastor Graham Scroge put it in uh, his commentary. He, uh, Graham, I, I believe he may have pastored Spurgeon's tabernacle after Spurgeon died, but either way, I think he was a student of Spurgeon. He says, Israel's sin was not in their desire for a monarchical form of government. See, there was a sense in which God was able to exercise his sovereign rule, no matter what form of government the Israelites had. Whether they had judges or whether they had kings, that wasn't the issue. So what was the issue? Well, as Scroge says, the issue was in their choice of a monarchy instead of the theocracy. Had the kings been loyal to God, the monarchy would still have been God-led. It still would have been a theocracy. God employing them as he had employed the judges, but Israel wanted to be like all the other nations, though they had been chosen and called for a very different purpose. They wanted a king with political power, earthly wisdom, and military might. A king who was wealthy, a king who's perhaps handsome and mighty in valor. Israel was rejecting their distinctiveness in favor of a common earthly king. And their rebellion points out two things in particular for us. It was selfish and it was cowardly. It was selfish and it was cowardly. It was selfish in timing, firstly, because they wanted a king to immediately rule over them. They, they weren't patient in faith to trust that God would fight the battles and win in his own timing. But it was also very cowardly because they sought a system of government that removed the need to trust and to pray and have faith in God. And as I was thinking back over the request of Israel this week to have a king and like all the nations, how many times have we prayed so many similar prayers? It got me thinking of those famous words by the missionary uh, to India, Amy Carmichael, who famously said many years ago, beware, beware of what you set your heart upon, for it will surely be yours. John Calvin, the great reformed pastor, said it many years ago, when God judges a nation, he gives wicked and evil rulers. In fact, one of the greatest judgments we see in the Bible from the hand of the living God is that far too often God will give us over to the desires of our hearts to teach us the sinful condition our hearts are in. So far too often, God is going to give us exactly what we desire in order to teach us our need for repentance and faith in Christ. The condition of our hearts and the condition our hearts are in are often reflective of the kinds of requests we bring before God in prayer. Be careful what you set your heart upon. A boy, a girl... Money, success, a house, a family, a wife, a spouse. For you may surely be granted that prayer in judgment over you. And that's exactly what we see God doing throughout the book of 1 Samuel. God gives to the people of Israel the very king and rulers they desire as a judgment over his people. And that leads us into our second point. This is the king that we asked for, the king we desired. After Samuel warns the people about those customary rights, that the king's going to reign in a tyrannical way over the people in chapter 8, that 
Isaac read out, we meet the future king, the very first king that will be uh, king of Israel soon enough at the beginning of chapter 9, King Saul. But notice how he's introduced. It's a very ordinary and non-magnificent story that we get here at the beginning of chapter 9. It says, now there was a prominent man of Benjamin named Kish, son of Abiel, son of Zeror, son of Becherah, son of Aphia, son of a Benjaminite. I practiced Benjaminite all week because I was tongue twisted. Benjaminite. <laughs> now he had a son named Saul, an impressive young man. But there was no one more impressive among the Israelites than he. He stood a head taller than anyone else. One day the donkeys of Saul's father, Kish, wandered off. Kish said to his son Saul, take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So Saul and his servants went through the hill country of Ephraim and then through the region of Shalishah, and they didn't find them. And then they went through the region of Shalim, nothing. Then they went through the Benjaminite region, still couldn't find them. And then they came to the land of Zuf. Saul said to the servant who was with him, come on, let's go back or my father will stop worrying about the donkeys and start to worry about us. Look, the servant said, there's a man of God in the city who is highly respected and everything he says is sure to come true. Let's go there now. Maybe he'll tell us the way we should go. It's a very interesting story. There's nothing really spectacular, is there, about the way that Saul's introduced. An ordinary guy looking for some ordinary donkeys on an ordinary day with an ordinary servant uh, that, that, that belongs to his father. And I think there's sort of the point that the author is trying to make here. The very first king over Israel, he's not really going to be anything special in terms of his character or content for the, for the people. Now, let's not, I mean, let's not read too much into that. Jesus came from very humble beginnings, didn't he? But at least Jesus had a few patriarchs in his name. I mean, notice, notice the several indications we have that Saul's going to be an ordinary king that is a judgment over the people. First, we, we have Saul being described from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, nothing too bad about Benjamin except the fact that they are the shadiest clan in Israel's history. Uh, <laughs> Benjamin, you may know, is the smallest tribe in Israel, described as a ravenous wolf in Genesis chapter 49. It wasn't that funny. <laughs> And they, in fact, had the shadiest, most notorious kind of history. <laughs> you may remember that uh, at the end of the book of Judges, if you know your Old Testament, um, there is actually a very horrific story where um, a man comes into the town of Benjamin where the people of Gibeah described as doing some really wicked things to uh, a really innocent woman. Um, it, I call it the darkest chapter in the Bible. If you ever have a chance, uh, don't do it now, but go home, read Judges 19 to the end of Judges. You'll see what I mean. The most horrific scene in, apart from the crucifixion, in all of the Old Testament, all of Scripture. Um, so putting that all together, uh, Saul is just from a shady line of Benjaminites. Second, we, we see that he's from a family line that I think is extremely non-distinguished in terms of uh, people. None of these names are really mentioned throughout Scripture again. They don't really hold any significant weight. As I said, there's no mention of Abraham, Isaac, no Jacob, no Joseph, Joshua, Boaz, Ruth. None of these names that hold kind of any weight or significance. Uh, Saul's from a father who's well known. His father's well distinguished in terms of money. His father's well off. But Saul comes himself from a line of shady nobodies. Uh, third, we learn that Saul is described, uh, again, only by his physical attributes. So there's nothing about his character before God, nothing about where his heart is. It's basically all we have is that he was extremely attractive, he was tall, and he maybe went to the gym a lot. Right? That's really all we get. Saul is kind of Israel's Goliath, if you will. He's attractive, he's muscular. We don't know if Goliath was attractive, but he's, he's big, he's muscular, he's tall. He may have been a good warrior, but nothing of noble character. And in fact, if you know, uh, Saul's name literally means the one asked for or asked for by the people. So Saul is going to become the, the personal manifestation of Israel's sin because people have asked for this kind of a king. The people ask for a king like the other nations, and he gives them a king like the other nations. He, he's tall, he might be strong and a good warrior, but that's about all they're going to get. And then we have these donkeys, the story of these donkeys that Saul is uh, looking after. 
Uh, it's not all that random in fact. You may remember that uh, in the ancient world, uh, donkeys were actually kind of a regal animal. A lot of kings and rulers rode into towns upon uh, donkeys. It sounds strange to us, but it's no accident that Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey in Matthew 21. Uh, and so if you're paying attention, you're, you're going to notice that, uh, number one, donkeys are associated with the idea of kingship, they're regal, they're royal things. But number two, it's interesting, the author takes strides to mention in, in chapter 9, Saul never actually ends up finding the donkeys. Like the one task he was, he was given by his father to find a bunch of lost donkeys, he, he never finds the donkeys. And it's sort of, I think, the author's way to say that if he can't, if he can't even find these lost donkeys, how's he going to, going to be able to lead God's people when it comes to him being made king? I mean, notice how David's described in the book of 1 Samuel. When he's announced as Israel's future king in 1 Samuel 16 and 17, it says David was looking after God's Sheep. And in fact, David would go out for one lost sheep. He would fight bears and lions in order to risk his life to bring back that, the, the lost sheep of his father's flock. David is described as a man of noble character, God given strength. Saul cannot find a bunch of silly lost donkeys. There's a comparison here. It's almost that this kind of comical way for the author uh, of Samuel to put in and tell us that Saul is always going to be looking out. Uh, he's always going to be chasing after the nobility of the kingship. He's always going to be chasing after the throne. He will get the throne. He will become king, but he will never be the king that David was. He's always, he never finds a donkey. He's symbolically showing he's never actually going to get to the, the, a king worthy of God's people. He's never going to be the kind of king that David is. Fourth, we see that uh, Saul was a man of great spiritual blindness. His spiritual condition is telling. Uh, he gets lost looking for donkeys and he wants to turn back, but it's, it's the servant who tells him about Samuel, who's in the city that they're in, in Zuth. Saul doesn't know about Samuel. Now, Samuel, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 3, I believe it is, he's described as a, a prophet that is attested to from Dan to Beersheba. Dan was all the way up in the north of Israel. Beersheba is in the south of Israel. The, the idea is that Samuel was known by all of Israel throughout the land as the preeminent prophet of the day. And when Saul and his servant show up in the city of Zulf, firstly, his servant has to tell him that Samuel's even there in the city, and secondly, when they're standing right in front of Samuel, Saul's like, hey, we're looking for this prophet. Samuel's like, I'm the guy. <laughs> That's me. Oh, okay. And it, like, th there's just this really blind spiritual state that Saul's in. All of Israel knew and attested to Samuel, and yet Saul doesn't even know who Samuel is. Completely and utterly blind to any kind of spiritual notion. This guy should not be a king or a leader of God's people. And then lastly, I just want to quickly consider the cowardice of this king. This is a cowardly king who will lead Israel. Have a look. Turn over to, to chapter 10, 1 Samuel chapter 10. At this point in the story, Israel has uh, rejected God. They've asked for a king like the nations. The authors introduced us to Saul. Saul find, uh, looks for these lost donkeys. He then uh, meets Samuel in the land of Zuf. Samuel then tells Saul that he's going to become king. Saul's like, what the? Why am I becoming king? I'm from the, the, you know, the least of the tribes, the tribe of Benjamin. And So Samuel then tells him about that. And then in chapter 10, we have sort of Saul's coronation to the kingship, at least introducing Saul to the people uh, of their king. The, the, the people that they asked for, you're about to meet the king who you requested. And so we read in 1 Samuel chapter 10, have a look at verse 17. Uh, uh, 10 is the big number. 17 is a little number if you're not familiar with the Bible. Uh, verse 17 in chapter 10, Samuel summoned the people to the Lord at Mizpah. This is Saul's coronation or announcement as king. And, and, and he said to the Israelites, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I brought uh, Israel out of Egypt and I rescued you from the power of the Egyptians and all the kingdoms that were oppressing you. But today you have rejected your God. 
who saves you from all your troubles and afflictions. And you said to him, you must set a king over us. And now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and clans. Samuel says, let's get this done. Let's get this king out here. Samuel had all the tribes of Israel come forward, and the tribe of Benjamin was selected. Then he had the tribe of Benjamin come forward by its clans, and the Matrite clan was selected. Finally, Saul, the son of Kish, was selected. Now notice, when they searched for him, they could not find him. Where is their king? So they inquired of the Lord, has the man come here yet? And notice the Lord has to tell them where Saul is hiding. The Lord replied, verse 22, that's him over there hiding behind the luggage. <laughs> he's, he's cowering over there behind the supplies. I mean, could you just imagine the tallest in Israel watching this thing unfold? Like he's calling out, don't be, like, the Benjamin, oh man, the Matra clan, don't call, don't, they called Saul. And he just hides from, from all of Israel. And so they ran, they got him from there. And when he stood among the people, he stood a head taller than anyone else. So Samuel said to all the people, do you see the one the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among the entire population. You got that right, Samuel. And all the people shouted, long live the king. This is their king, tall, handsome, and cowardly. Behold your king, O Israel. Jared Longshore, a pastor in the States, candidly tries to recount the conversations that the Israelite people would have on their day back from the land of Zuf, from the land of Mizpah, sorry, that day after Saul is announced as king. It's an imaginary story, but you can, you can just picture in your mind, dad's in the front seat, deep in thought, mum's sitting in the camel in the front seat next to dad, and <laughs> she turns to her husband, she says, well, honey... What did you think of the gathering today? Not what I was expecting, the husband replies. Why was the king hiding in the luggage, the little one asks. You know, dear, I'm not quite sure, says the mum. He sure was tall and handsome, the little one says. Yes, and I heard that he even prophesied, says mum. How did he do that? Well, Dad says, God sent the Spirit upon him, of course. He's clearly a man of God, but what man could do that without God's approval? And then suddenly a small voice from the oldest child in the back of the camel pipes up and says, but didn't Samuel say we were rejecting God? The trip was filled with silence for many miles. See, this is the scene to which the people of Israel now turn in rebellion against God when they ask to give them a king. The, the people wanted a king like all the other nations. And God gives them a king shaped after their own hearts like the other nations. What troubles come when our broken lives and hopes are put into broken men, broken people, when our hope is built on nothing less than human blood and righteousness, God will give to us handsome, tall, and cowardly leaders in judgment because they're the kind of leaders that we deserve. That's the kind of king that we're after. A king after our own fashion, a king after our own hearts, a king that we want to try to manipulate and control. But time and time again, brothers and sisters, the Bible is clear that we need a godly king who is unlike the other nations, a king who's righteous, a king who will love the law of God, who will obey the law of God. We need a king who will recite the words of the law according to Deuteronomy 17 and write them down in a book and recite them to all the people so that his heart is not turned away toward other gods of the nations. We need a king who's worthy of our time, our affections, and everything that we are. And that's what I want us to briefly consider as we turn to the third point here tonight, the king that we so desperately need. The king that we need. 
In chapter 11, briefly summarized, Saul has a few good moments where his humility and strength actually leads him to victory and favor over the Lord's enemies. You know what that tells us? Saul was actually quite humble to begin with. He was actually an okay leader, so to speak. He wasn't the right guy, but it was the best he did for the the situation he was placed in. And to begin with, he actually started off okay. He defeats uh, the, the Ammonites in verses 1 to 11. Saul is an officially anointed king over Israel and set to serve the people of Israel. But then we hit chapter 12 in our text tonight. We have Samuel coming to the end of his ministry as a judge. He's he's sort of coming to the end of his life and and he wants to address Israel one last time. He wants to give them the word of the Lord and so he decides to give this plea to the nation of Israel. And at the heart of the plea really is beginning at verse uh, 13 Verse 13 of chapter 12. Now, here is the king you've chosen, the the one you requested. Look, this is the king the Lord's placed over you. If you fear the Lord, if you worship and obey him, and if you don't rebel against his commands, then both you and the king who reigns over you will follow the Lord your God. However, if you disobey the Lord and rebel against his command, the Lord's hand will be against you as was against your ancestors. And then drop your eyes down to 24. Samuel basically says the same thing. Above all, fear the Lord. Worship him faithfully with all your heart. Consider the great things he has done for you. However, if you continue to do what is evil, both you and your king will be swept away. And we're going to see this principle play out again when we're in rebellion against God, when we do not live, when we don't trust and obey God and his law, God and his word, God will reign in judgment over us because we need a king that is so much better than Saul, so much better than David, Solomon, and all of the kings after that. We need a king that is going to trust and obey God perfectly, a king who will serve God in perfect obedience so that we won't be swept away because we are not good people. We are rebels by nature. We cannot possibly live up to the expectations of God's law perfectly, and we need a king to do that in our place. And the only king who can meet the qualifications is one who is fully God and fully man, who has come to appear in front of his people as their king. I want to finish here tonight with a a story that possibly many of us know from childhood. It's a famous children's novel that uh, is called Are You My Mother by P.D. Eastman. Who's read that? Who remembers that as a child? I've got a few hands here and there. Okay, yep, not too many. If you haven't read it, it's basically the story of a little bird who's at the top of a tree, he's in an egg, he's not yet hatched, and his mother realizes that she needs to go and find food for her son when he's born. So she flies off to find food, and so he hatches in the meantime while she's gone, and he, he, there's no mother, there's no one in the nest, he's by himself. And so he, he sort of falls out of the tree and comes down to the bottom, and, and so the book catalogs the journey of this bird to find his mother when he starts running into these objects and animals around him, and each time he runs into these objects, he kind of looks at them and says, are you my mother? So he runs into a kitten, and he says, are you my mom? And he runs into a cow, and he asks the cow, are you my mother? He runs into the dog, and he asks the dog, are you my mom? He runs into a plane, he runs into a car, he runs into a tractor. Are you my mom? Each time the baby bird latches on in hope, thinking to itself that maybe, just maybe, it's finally found the one that he was created to know. And it just goes to demonstrate that the condition of the human heart, as we think about that story, bring it to a spiritual aspect, the human heart really does latch onto anything in front of it who could possibly be our mums. Our dads, our God, our kings, our saviors. 
and we will put our hope in anything other than God himself. And God knows, Jesus knows the condition of the human heart. He knows the tendency that we will latch onto anything that is in front of us. And so 2,000 years ago, he appeared in human flesh as the object of our affections to appear right in front of us. God becomes man in Jesus Christ and literally stands in front of his people as the only king. Visible for all to see, visible to all of his people. And he declares, I am the good shepherd. I am the good leader. I am the good king. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. I'll never leave. I'll never forsake. I'll never let go of any of those that the Father has given to me. And notice the contrast between Jesus Christ and all the other kings and shepherds that Israel had. All those other shepherds that take from you. He says, I will give you abundant life. All those other shepherds and leaders that oppress you, I will set you free. All those leaders that gain from you, I lay down my life so that you can take yours up. In a world full of darkness, pain, sin, suffering, and especially abusive leaders, we as God's church continue to look to the one who's the perfect shepherd, the perfect priest, the perfect pastor, the perfect Lord, the perfect leader, the perfect king. Jesus Christ, who never leaves, never forsakes, never grows old, never appoints sons, wicked sons as leaders, never grows tired. Jesus is the greater David, the one whom our hearts were made to know. And if you've never, you've never been able to say that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, then I, I beg you tonight, do not leave here without talking to someone about what it means to have your sins forgiven so that if you were to die tonight, you would not face the judgment of a holy God who punishes sinners. But you would face a God who says, come to me and I will give you rest because my son has paid the price for your sin. Jesus Christ, our only hope, our peace, so that as we walk with the Lord, we may trust and we may obey by his grace. Let's pray. Gracious and heavenly Father, Lord, we, we thank you for this uh, time in your word where we can just look. And although it was just a very, very big, brief summation, Lord, we thank you for the content of its pages, which is that we need Christ. We need Jesus to rule and to reign because every other leader and king will ultimately disappoint. Even the best and godliest of men have clay feet. They are men at best, and we, we thank you that that is not true of Jesus. That is not true that Jesus is just a man, but he is the God-man who took on flesh to be our God and our King. And we thank you, Lord. We thank you for sending your Son to a helpless nation as us, a helpless people who could not save ourselves. So, Lord, be with us as we walk through the week in your statutes and your laws, seeking to honor you as our king. May, may we live differently and distinct from all the other people in our workplaces, in our lives, in our schools. And people may just ask what it is that's different about us and that we can tell them of the king who is unlike any king they have. So we thank you for that. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.